started. Um, today is my greatest pleasure to introduce Professor Augusto Bushwitz. How do you pronounce your name properly? I usually check in with the speaker. We didn't have too much time beforehand. Buchwitz. Buchwitz. All right. Does it sound better? All right, Buck White. Um, and I've known him for many years, but still apparently I can't pronounce his last name. He is a new associate professor of psychology, psychological sciences at University of Connecticut. He was supposed to join during COVID and uh, he joined in uh, January this year. He was giving, he was teaching and in the middle of teaching this semester, he moved all the way from Brazil with his family. And so you can imagine how hectic the semester must have been, and uh, so we're, it's, it's fantastic to have you here finally today. He's also a Philat member or research scientist at Haskins Laboratory where, uh, Laboratories, where he has been collaborating for many, many years. And um, he has, even though he's from Brazil, he has extensive training and collaborators in the United States. First, he got his PhD in language and linguistics from the Universidad Federal de Santa Catarina, Brazil, where he investigated the brain basis of late bilinguals. Um, and he was a visiting scholar and postdoc for three years at Carnegie Mellon University with a um, very well-known uh, language scientist imaging person called Marcel Just. And he investigated the brain basis of late bilinguals there. I'm sorry, he was, he was with Marcel just for several years. And then he was an associate professor of psychology at the Pontifical Catholic University of RS. I apologize, I'm kind of reading it off. So I'm most likely not saying it correctly. And also it's he was a senior researcher at the Brain Institute of Rio Grande do Sal. His research interests involve using fMRI to investigate early literacy, developmental dyslexia, but also he's very well known in looking at the effects of the environment on cognitive development, especially leveraging the unique environment and um, the research and the environment that he has in he has had in Brazil and other countries in, in that area. And we'll hopefully we'll hear more of that also. Um, he's a principal investigator. He's also well known for um, disseminating Brazil wide, I think, a Grafo game, which is an early literacy app um, in Brazil. He was nominated for Brazil's National Education Council in 2020 and the technical advisor for Brazil's National Public School textbook program for daycare and preschool books. He's currently working with the international development banks on early literacy at Tech Solutions to assist teaching and evaluation. So I've been dying to hear him talk about all these different things and how they fit together. It seems like he's going to try to fit all this in in an hour. And I'm very looking forward to hearing from him. So thank you very much for joining everyone in Augusto and um, please start. All right. Uh, thank you. Can you see my slides? All right. It's not in slideshow mode. It's in the presenter mode, I think. Or it's not in. Yes. Can you swap displays if you have two screens? Oh, sure. Um, Let me see. Let me share the right one, I guess. This one. Yep. All right. Looks great. All right. So thank you, Fumiko, and uh, thank you to all the you know the Berk group for having me. We we had we canceled twice. One was my fault, uh, and uh, I'm really glad to be here. Um, I was actually hired during a really difficult time, as most of you know, and I never had a job talk. So I think. Fumiko, if I may, I'm going to make this kind of my job talk, and that's why it's a bit of a story. Um, we will go into some of the results and some of the findings that we have in Brazil, but uh, you'll see that there's always there's also a little narrative that kind of starts with the title and uh, why I chose to you know use the uh, pink, famous Pink Floyd song as my title. Um, I uh, will try to you know make a connection between my early start and how we built the lab from scratch in Brazil and then you know what we this transition now to the US um, and I apologize that I did assume that the audience has a little bit of understanding of brain functional neuroanatomy but if you know if I went too fast in that sense please ask questions later and also there's the literature uh, you know that I'm presenting and suggesting with the references. So basically, um, a bit of a background, uh, really quickly, you know, what's with this title and 
uh, you know, how we started an fMRI, fMRI lab from scratch uh, 10 years ago. Like, so this story today isn't, you know, that much, uh, and it doesn't carry as much weight as it did a long time ago. It's a lot easier to set up things these days, but um, it was an interesting experience. And I, uh, uh, I just, you know, the two notes that I put there, the, when we, myself and a colleague who's now here at the Nathan Klein Institute, Nate, Alex Franco, when we arrived at the Brain Institute in Brazil in 2012 together, uh, the screen was off center and there was a DVD player hooked up to it. So that was the idea of, a, of an fMRI setup uh, that we, it took us a year to, to work our way towards a, a workable uh, fMRI, uh, you know, visual and auditory presentation and stimulus uh, collection, you know, at least behave, uh, uh, you know, motor response behaviors. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this reading clinic that we developed, that we established for developmental dyslexia. It lasted um, about uh, seven to eight years. Uh, the interruption in 2020 has to do with the pandemic, of course, and it was a bit of an of a unfortunate interruption because, um, you know, the, the last two years we were really, we had a really smooth engine running and we were scan scanning a lot more kids than we uh, used to and uh, could have reached higher numbers. Uh, a little bit about uh, uh, our, st our study on violence in teenage brains that was carried out in Brazil and then later in Tegucigalpa, Honduras. This was an interesting collaboration with the Inter-American uh, Development Bank. I'm not gonna have time to talk about the machine learning stuff. So just a quick note, and then you know, those of you who are interested can search some of our publications. This was something that I built on from being Marcel Just's lab in the early 2000s when they published the first machine learning and fMRI studies. We published one on bilingual uh, decoding of semantic concepts. And uh, back in Brazil, we also did some of that with uh, using both uh, um, open database sets, the Abide Autism database, and our own, and some of the later developments. So. Um, why did I put uh, leave them kids alone? And a little bit of background on the story. I was, you know, my PhD, started my PhD in 2002, finished in 2006. Uh, and then in 2005, I was a visiting scholar with uh, at the CCBI. And that was the first time, you know, back then I started, I, the names Heft and Pew, among other Haskins scientists whom I now, and Yukon researchers who I now have the, honor to be, you know, a colleague um, were in the literature that I was reading. And I was talking to Fumiko yesterday, and she remembered the Power for Kids, the P4K studies. And this is a picture from, you know, 20, my postdoc years, maybe this is like 2009, 2010. And um, after that, I moved to Brazil. And uh, for those of you who are postdocs, this is just a you know, a fair warning of what academia does to you in 10 years, you, you lose your hair and it all goes gray. But I guess it happens to everyone, but I think academia is pretty good about that. Um, Every president gets gray hair also. When they, <laughs> that's true. So it's just well, like, I mean, I, it's I'm not comparing my responsibilities to that, <laughs> no way. Um, well, yeah, you're setting up the whole cognitive neuroscience psych initiatives and kind of revamp Stanford. So that's fantastic. Well, yeah, and uh, it, it was um, it was fun. I don't I really love my job. I enjoy what I'm doing. But, um, you know, I think every job comes with its, uh, you know, a lot of stress. I'm just really, uh, you know, joking, but you will you know lose hair over it. So in 2012, uh, it was it was a, a, an interesting coincidence that both Alex Frankel, this former colleague of mine who's now here again. Um, we were both hired and we didn't know we were being hired at the same time by the Pontifical Catholic University to help you know, build the Brain Institute. And the 2012 picture of the Institute is right on your right there in Southern Brazil. So where we were is much closer to Uruguay and Argentina than Sao Paulo and Rio, for example. And back in 2012, only Rio and Sao Paulo had fMRI labs running uh, two major ones. And um, in, back in 2005, when I had my PhD, there was none. Um, that's, you know, I owe a lot of a, debt, a big debt of gratitude to the CCBI for allowing me to do my PhD there. And I added some pictures there of 2021 when we got the new scanner and 2022 when the Brain uh, Institute was finally expanded uh, to, you know, it's, it tripled in size, though Alex and I did leave, uh, you know, it's, it's a 
it's a fine institute. And if you go online, you can find all the research that is done there. They have been doing uh, important stuff in, especially in um, um, uh, aging and uh, Alzheimer's research and stem cell research. Um, so, you know, make it from scratch. That's Alex and I really happy when we got the, our fMRI simulator. This is uh, HBM 2014 or 2015, I can't really remember. It's the, it was the first simulator now of Latin America when we bought it, the PST net people were really happy because it was the first time they were selling to the Southern American hemisphere. And this is uh, when we finally set up the, you know, the screen, it was not ideal, it was in the front and on the back, but it took us a year to be able to adjust the cage, line it with a, with a scanner and put all the, the setup that we needed. Uh, because of course we share with clinic so we had to work weekends sometimes, and uh, but we finally did it. And uh, it was, you know, it's just good memories and nice to be able to tell the story that we built this lab from scratch. That the screen that sits here and presents data, and this is the GE three Tesla scanner that we use to collect all the data that I'm going to show to you. I never really got to use a Siemens scanner, unfortunately. Um, and the screen that is in here is actually sitting on uh, bricks that we put <laughs> to lift the the screen from the where they had put the, uh, the base for it, which was really, really low. Um, anyway, so now to, to the actual scientific stuff. Um, and why, you know, what's with the title? Uh, why did I put that title? When I was first hired, I remember having a meeting with some of the more uh, tenured professors in different areas. And one came up to me and said, why don't you just leave these kids alone? You know, why would you put kids in a scanner? What's the point of doing that? And, you know, it's a fair question. It's not, you know, why we, we have to ask ourselves that. It's, it's an ethical question. But I remember just being really taken aback. And the reason, you know, I, I like telling that story is just because it was so, you know, it's only 10 years ago, but it was so new uh, to be doing brain imaging and especially brain imaging with children, you know, in the eight to 10 year old range um, in Brazil. And there were no, you know, there are no studies in that with that, with fMRI, especially in that age range. So what we, how we, you know, we, it was, it, it was a fair question, the kind of, you know, typical question that you get when you're trying to do new things sometimes is one way we addressed it, I think, is we created a pro bono reading clinic that um, allow, uh, afforded evaluation, a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary evaluation of, of kids uh, who were struggling to read and were aged eight to uh, 12. Um, they didn't have to be from public schools. We accepted any, any children. You know, there's, uh, you know, there's this whole procedure that we went through for, through phone calls and testing. Uh, our team had uh, speech therapists, uh, students, uh, neurologists, radiologists, and everyone, you know, did the work there for free. So there's a lot of people that I have to thank and who helped me keep this uh, clinic going for such a long time and be able to evaluate over a thousand kids, um, you know, with different reading difficulties, as you will understand how, you know, that's, it's a big challenge to find developmental dyslexia and establish a, a trustworthy diagnosis in Brazil. Um, it, uh, we scanned over a hundred kids with uh, developmental uh, dyslexia over these years. Um, it, it basically took us two to three months to, you know, sometimes go through the evaluation with having parents, you know, they had to come over a couple of times to the Brain Institute. They would, you know, sometimes miss appointments and reschedule. So, on average, we would, you know, this, it meant that we would be able to scan 10 to 12 uh, kids um, over the, the, the academic year. Um, and we also ran a longitudinal study that I'm gonna tell you a little bit about. Um, we published, you know, protocols with, with interview templates for uh, developmental dyslexia uh, relevant medical history, all free to use. And we also, as a result, published the a free screening test for developmental dyslexia that has 16 very simple four-point scale questions um, um, that teachers uh, can use. Uh, at the time, it was, you know, the, the study had, I think it, it had a big impact, impact also nationwide 
we, you know, we were featured in, in, in national news more than once. Uh, this is just one example. It's Portuguese, and there's a little transcription, but this was on national TV when they were talking about, um, talking about um, you know, one of the kids that we had worked with and uh, her, the challenges that she faced. And I think, um, you know, in addition to the academic impact and, uh, and the scientific impact, this was something that I learned during my postdoc years, and I have to be thankful to uh, Marcel just for this, is sometimes we are, you know, I guess, a little bit averse to talking to reporters. And he, he once told me, because we, there was a Brazilian national uh, channel that, that went all the way to Carnegie Mellon to interview Marcel and myself when we were doing the, the brain imaging and machine learning. And you know, I was kind of, well, you know, a TV interview, and he said, you know, if you're lucky, 10 people will read your papers, but a TV interview can reach millions. And it's true. It was through that interview that I actually met the director of the Brain Institute in uh, uh, Brazil. So we, you know, we... Vitória agora faz parte de um grupo de 700 crianças de Porto Alegre, Natal, so that's Florianópolis. Just, that's just, just going to stop right there. It's just a transcription. Uh, this is just a sample from the from the screening test, you know, the questions that they answer, you guys can, can go after that. So part of this challenge in Brazil, it has to do with, uh, and this is pre-pandemic data, on average, uh, 50, 40 to 50% of third graders are not reading at level. That means that, uh, you know, half of, of a, a third grade class uh, uh, cannot read or understand anything past the title and first sentence in a paragraph or a text. And 20% are not reading at all. So that means, you know, about a fifth of kids are not even decoding uh, words. Um, so I, I usually like to show this slide from my uh, longitudinal study. Ah, I think someone has a mic open. Um, you know, the distribution of the kids when we first started uh, in third grade, about, you know, 26 out of 131 that we followed in Porto Alegre, there were other two other cities. Uh, we started with 700 kids and we ended up with a total of 303 cities. We lost a lot of them during the, the four years. Uh, about 26 of these, you know, about 20% were, you know, what you would consider at risk for dyslexia. And it's obviously not true that you have 20% of kids who are dyslexic. You know, that's not... Uh, it doesn't make any sense in relation to the epidemiology of, of you know, the, the prevalence of dyslexia uh, worldwide. And, you know, some of the challenges from our data, you can see here, we plot, you know, over different uh, tests, like their accuracy and, um, um, for example, here it's the accuracy in word reading. So good readers and our average readers, they have a similar uh, behavior here in, in accuracy, and, but the IQ, SCS, and age-matched peers for the dyslexic kids, they be, you know, their, their performance is very similar. So it's not that poor readers, you know, are just below a certain standard. The, usually, the, if you look at an average that is data-driven in Brazil, based on what kids are actually reading and not what the ideal standard would be, even your good readers are not going to be reading that well. And um, it's really hard to work uh, with these kids and, and not hard, but, you know, it's a challenge to separate who is just having difficulties and who is actually a, uh, a child with uh, the learning disorder. The same goes for fluency, you know, poor and dyslexic readers are about the same in terms of speed, though in dyslexia, there's usually a little bit more variation. Uh, this is a really bad picture, but it's from a, a, an evidence-based practice book we published and it's just to give you an idea, over the first two years of the clinic, uh, all we're showing here is the bars are the number of kids diagnosed with dyslexia, um, the number of kids who were inconclusive, and the number of kids who had difficulties but were non-dyslexia in terms of um, fluency, accuracy, and comprehension. So it was, you know, there's a lot of kids here who are inconclusive, all these 20 kids and 25 here for, for accuracy and ended up being conclusive. And what we would do sometimes, most times, is ask them to come back six months later and try to provide them some sort of um, 
intervention. Uh, since we didn't have money for them, one of the interventions that we were able to do once was a, an intervention with articulatory, uh, focus on articulation of, of sounds uh, integrated with uh, phonemic awareness, which we were able to provide for a couple of years when I had a master's student. A student. But you know, uh, other times what we were able to do is provide a, a report that allowed these kids and their families to ask for uh, special uh, accommodations in school and try to find uh, some, you know, state provided or uh, some help with uh, speech therapists or, or pedagogical, uh, you know, uh, uh, tutors. Um, you know, some of the further impact of the study, you know, it's, of course, it's not because of it, but this year we finally, in uh, Brazil, finally elected, enacted a law that recognizes developmental dyslexia and ADHD as uh, two disorders that have to be accommodated for in school. And we were part of the panel of specialists. This took over 10 years to do. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Graphical Game Brazil. The, as Fumiko mentioned, I was able to work with Brazil's National Board of Education and supervise the, the provision of uh, textbooks for pre-K and K uh, public schools for the first time with early literacy and numeracy. And, but of course, you know, the, what we did with the, with the reading clinic and of course my students, you know, and the impact they had and um, was really, uh, you know, all worth it during this time. So now to, you know, let's get to some imaging. Um, so I think we did leave these kids alone and we, because it was all volunteer, we advertised, um, you know, that families could bring their kids for evaluation. They didn't have to do the imaging and they would still get the evaluation if they didn't want to put their children in the scanner, though most of them did anyway. And the ones who didn't get the diagnosis and sometimes weren't invited to do the fMRI were sometimes actually um, bummed out because they, you know, what they got from the, from the imaging was uh, a radiologist would, you know, give them a full report, uh, you know, neuroanatomical reading, um, uh, you know, if, that everything was okay. Uh, so we had, we have two major studies I, I'd like to report. There are some side studies, um, but uh, the cross-sectional study of developmental dyslexia, which we scanned about 100 kids over these years uh, with that age range. And I think we have about 80 of those who are actually uh, usable. And a longitudinal study um, that we scanned 65 kids twice uh, at, you know, within one year of their going to school, though that one is, is largely unpublished still. And this is something I remember from, you know, from being a postdoc and a pre-doc is my first fMRI paper was using data that was collected before I arrived at the CCBI. And uh, because I had learned to, to pre-process data, I was given a data set and said, you know, this isn't published. If you, if you can pre-process it and make sense of it, and there's something there, you can, you know, try to publish. And we did, this is a 2008 Japanese bilingual uh, study that we published. Uh, I, I just remember thinking who has data sitting around. And, you know, now that I look back and I understand there's a lot of stuff that we, sometimes can't get to and it's unfortunate but i think we you know we will um so okay oops um the fmri or mri protocol um that we did there was one part that was um common to the longitudinal and to the cross-sectional study they all did of course a structural and the resting state and there was one lexical decision task with words and pseudo words. Uh, the longitudinal study also included the number sense and, and arithmetic operation. Uh, we did do the Haskins fast language look um, on their second uh, visit, which is when I met Ken and Haskins and we did you know, the Portuguese version of that. Uh, and we also have other studies and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the social stress one, but no time to, you know, I won't have time to bring the syntactic priming and ambiguity results yet. Um, so the lexical decision was, you know, when we were starting, we try to be really conservative in terms of, okay, what can we do that's validated and it's probably going to give us results. So we started just doing resting state, um, 
a structural task and then including a ward reading task from an age appropriate ward reading test. It had 20 regular wards, 20 irregular and 20 pseudo wards. And we piloted and you know figured out that dyslexic kids sometimes took four to, to almost seven seconds to decode the ward and make a decision. So they had you know controls and dyslexics had about seven set had seven seconds to decide if the ward existed after they read. And this was you know the the sort of uh, main task that we did with every single participant uh, from all of our studies, including, you know, the rest of the state. Um, just a, a recap, I mean, all of you who do imaging and are interested in literacy, you're well aware of, of the visual ward form area or the ventral occipital area that is one of the signs or markers of reading uh, skill and learning to read. This is an area uh, at the junction of the occipital and temporal lobes that's been found to activate for reading and be associated with reading skill development and not activate in dyslexia in different languages. These are some of the older studies, but you know, there are studies that go all the way to more recent years and uh, meta-analyses uh, continuously showing that the ventral occipital or the visual word form area is this sort of area of the brain that tunes to uh, reading skill. And it possibly has to do with some of the particular aspects of reading, such as you know the fact that we have to break the mirror invariance of, of letters and that kind of uh, uh, stuff. So you know, just to recap, and um, again, we were very conservative in the beginning. So with the word reading task, we, you know, we were very happy that we found the same effect with all types of words in the visual ward form area. Uh, you know, we put a seed right where the traditional stanislaus Stehain location is uh, for the visual ward form area, and we found a significant difference in activation for all three types of words in the task and the average of all words. And this is the, you know, the first study, study published with uh, dyslexic kids in any Latin American country. Um, and we were, you know, this, it took a while, but, uh, and the, I think this is a, you know, there's two, two smaller groups, about 16 in each. Like, so today we would have a lot more, but we, we were, what we're trying to do at the time, and even though this is a, a 2018 publication, it was submitted two years before almost, um, is really get out there and be, you know, one of the first to publish it in Latin America on developmental dyslexia and not, not just the first, but bring something relevant. So the paper includes, you know, this more conservative uh, functional MRI task showing a difference in activation for words, uh, pseudo words and regular words between um, typical readers and dyslexic readers. But what we also found is we had the resting state task. And when we put a seed in the visual word form area, what we found is there was a significant difference in resting state connectivity uh, of the visual ward form area and the, uh, the posterior cingulate cortex. So in very brief, simple terms, when our brains are at rest, there's what we call a default mode, which is basically uh, sets of areas they can be associated with auditory processing, motor processing, or just the traditional default mode, which includes anterior cingulate, posterior cingulate, like this one, that basically are highly connected when we are at rest. And there are several studies that show there may be uh, indications of brain function at rest differences in clinical groups, for example, that help us understand, you know, what is going on in the autistic brain or other uh, situations or the other the mental disorders. We actually have one uh, machine learning, actually deep learning paper in which we took the ABI data set, which is about a thousand participants, 500 dyslexic and 500 controls, and we use that resting state to try and uh, identify who was dyslexic and who, uh, who was autistic and who wasn't. And, you know, that identification has no clinical value in the real world. But when we looked at the data and asked, okay, so because we, we achieved 
a, a significantly high uh, um, accuracy at the time. It was at the time it was the highest that we were probably beaten by now. It was 76 to 77 percent, which in real world diagnostics has no value. But um, we also asked, so what, you know, what is the connectivity? What are the uh, correlations and anti-correlations that are helping uh, us, you know, identify with a deep learning algorithm who is autistic and who isn't. And one of the main differences was anterior, posterior PCC and frontal lobe uh, connectivity in that case. So just as an example, and here what we found is that the visual word form area at rest was basically not connected, you know, for dyslexic kids with the posterior cingulate cortex. And, you know, why would that matter? Well, for typical kids, it is significantly, uh, there's a significant functional uh, connectivity between those two areas. And that's also uh, a region of the brain that has at rest usually is well connected with, you know, primary auditory uh, regions. What does that mean? That, well, you know, part of a speculation or interpretation is the brain at rest is always sort of ready to, to process uh, auditory information and there maybe there are some connections that have to be kept in online and standby you know it's like I the example I always like to give it's when you hear someone speak to you in your own language or language you understand you know as long as it's audible you it's impossible not to comprehend not to I'm going to you know to think I'm not going to understand this your brain immediately processes that information and you understand and just like when you learn to read it's impossible to look at that word resting state and think I am not going to read this. So it's kind of like maybe at rest there's once you learn to read, just like when, you know, our brains are always ready to process auditory information. It should, you know, readers, typical readers have some sort of functional connectivity at rest that indicates that their brain is, is tuned in with the visual word from there. Uh, some of the stuff in preparation here I'm gonna, uh, and uh, under review, I'm just going to glance over, uh, you know, it's um, some, there's some interesting results here, but we haven't, that we haven't published yet. One of the nice results from the longitudinal study, of course, there's, you know, we have, you know, these good and poor reader comparisons over the two years, but uh, we, what we did find is um, uh, an interaction between reading and math in the supermarginal drivers. And the other, other two studies I'm going to show you is the social stress study the, and the brain bank. So actually, the order here is different than the one I'm presenting. Um, the social stress study emerged from my collaboration with a, a former colleague, Dr. Grassi Oliveira, who actually moved to Denmark now. Uh, and he uh, you know, focuses on stress and the effects of violence and that collaboration with him, um, I had a, a postdoc at the time who had a PhD in um, genetics and helped me develop a social stress trier for dyslexia. So what's, what a, what's a trier? A trier is when you try to create, inoculate stress in people. Of course, you know, we're, it, what we mean here by stress has to be very carefully uh, designed, and I'm going to show you what we mean by it. You know, it's, it's has it's it's you know generally not something that is going to harm someone, right? So, you know, why are we looking at the at the at the stress? And uh, no, you know, our idea was to look at dyslexia. So what we did is we collected cortisol uh, in saliva during this this study i'm going to show you how it you know, was done um but just to know uh in the other study i'm going to show you what we looked for was uh, cortisol levels in um in hair and there i mean there's no norm for cortisol really so it's always kind of relative you have to you know be able to compare to other groups and this is the the protocol so kids would you know they would arrive we were of course explain everything that was going on uh, way before uh, they they could leave the room if they didn't like it uh, and we started collecting their you know their baseline saliva but the stressful task was they would get in a room there were judges uh, a neutral uh, a neutral judge a a uh, sort of good judge that would smile and you know give 
uh, positive comments and a, a, a bad judge that would be a person that would, you know, shake their head or whatever. Um, and they would read Harry Potter for about five minutes and we would collect saliva at different times. Uh, and there were control kids here too. Um, so looking at their levels of cortisol and saliva are, you know, this is, was, this is one of the unfortunate uh, results of the pandemic. Uh, right when we were at about 17 per group, the pandemic broke out and we had at the time money to go all the way to 30. Uh, that study is gone. That money also had to be, you know, there was no way we could continue doing the social stress because even with masks on, there's, you know, it covers your face and the visual cues that you're supposed to give. So we, you know, we just stopped, but we haven't published this yet, but we did find that there's a significant difference in how the cortisol and saliva behaves over the trier. But usually what you want to find here is that you are able to inoculate stress even in the controls. And it kind of looks like the controls have little or no effect in the, in the trier. So, but anyway, uh, there is a difference here in a significant difference in terms of um, how the dyslexic readers uh, react to that situation. And our, you know, we're, we're under review, we're, we're putting online all of the data we collected over these eight or nine years. And the brain bank for dyslexia, even though we have scanned about 100 kids, I think like the really usable data is uh, about 80 dys developmental dyslexia participants. And for this comparison, for example, you know, which is kind of a conservative comparison, but also a sanity check, um, we were able to sort of create two balanced groups with uh, 50 t, 53 typical readers from the longitudinal study and control for SES and age and IQ. And, but we did find you know, some of the expected or what would one would hope for differences in neuroanatomy. So the thickness of left inferior parietal and uh, left lateral occipital uh, was significant uh, between the two uh, groups, you know, the controls and the the uh, developmental dyslexia kids uh, using this uh, MNI template uh, for uh, you know regions, brain regions. Uh, other regions uh, appear there too, and there's actually a little, a couple in the right hemisphere. But just in the interest of uh, you know going more to the point, this is some of the differences that we found. And this, all of this, some of this data, uh, because it's it's basically we're replicating in Portuguese findings that you now we have in other languages. We have consolidated in one paper that we're going to publish as we put the brain bank online. So it'll be one paper that you know has a, a description of all the data um, and the differences that we found and between the groups. And um, it will also be the, the paper that sort of sets the access to uh, our um, fMRI and MRI um, on data. I think we, I could, I could be mistaken, but putting all the studies together, I think there is about nearly about 400 participants in all from the different studies. Some of them are not, are not even mentioned here, by the way. Okay. Um, and then the number sense task, uh, this was in the longitudinal study. And this is a result that is, you know, we've been working on over the past year. You now this data has been sitting there for a while, but kids uh, in the longitudinal study, in their first visit, they would do a number sense. You know, they, they would get these geometrical figures distributed randomly on the screen. They had to count them and then they would get you know a number and have to answer yes or no if the number uh, of of items they saw was the same as the as the you know the representation um so what uh part of the of the findings that we have right now is you know and this again these are sanity check these are not necessarily groundbreaking findings but you know these kids are showing a positive correlation in super marginal and IPL uh, areas with task accuracy. Um, and then a negative correlation with speed in this a little more posterior area uh, uh, of the superior parietal lobe, which may here have to do with uh, uh, executive function and working memory also. Um, so we're working on making a coherent story of these findings in math, uh, in the number sense, and in the arithmetic task. And in the arithmetic task, one interaction that we looked for is, so if we look at the good readers and the average readers and the poor readers, 
and separate them in groups, you know, what's what areas uh, of activation are going to emerge if we uh, look for interaction, interaction with their reading skill, um, the measures of their reading skill. So for the average readers and the poor readers, what we see is the, are, are these clusters of negative, you know, a negative correlation with um, the inferior parietal supramarginal angular gyrus region. And here, part of the discussion that we're trying to go deeper into is, like I said, what we mean here by average reader is not the reader who is at the expected average, but a data-driven measure of, okay, we had you know, 65 kids, what was the average, the median, who was in the you know, 80th percentile and above, who was in the 30th or 20th percentile and below. And you know, finding these somewhat similar brain function uh, results for the average readers. And again, here, you know, what we're looking at is act activation in the math task, but in interaction with their reading skill is we're sort of trying to make a story here and look for evidence that, um, and probably you know, putting some of these average readers together with the poor readers, what is the interaction in, in areas of brain function that are important for, for, for reading, but also emerging evidence show important for math and arithmetic, such as you know, these inferior parietal regions that we always see in reading and part of you know, this decoding loop, as we know. And the supermarginal and angular gyrus have emerged very consistently. Oh, by the way, every result I've shown you and I will show you today is always corrected for multiple comparisons. Okay, so there's no uncorrected data here. Um, I did. I just I noticed that there is a lot of stuff in the bottom, but you know, telling you what it is. And here, uh, it's about mm, twenty to twenty-five kids in each of these groups, it, uh, as we divided, you know, the sixty-five longitudinal study kids in three. So, you know, this is something that we're developing further uh, and still looking at, and we're trying to map, for example, how the fusiform gyrus activation and the angular gyrus activation behaved from visit one to visit two and in relation to uh, their performance and, and those two time points. Had they improved their reading? Did it stay the same? Did their math improve? Did it stay the same? And using out-of-scanner measures, and we actually have you know, school data for these kids for four years, though we only scanned them over two. We have data one year before the scanner uh, for the year they were scanned, the year they were scanned again, and for the year after. So that's what we're working on right now and trying to make a more coherent story, even though it would be nicer to have more participants. And here, a little, just a little bit about graphic game. I'm actually gonna skip that and because there's graphic game at the end and I'll get back to it, but it's, it's definitely a result of our work and now Graphogame Brazil, their graphical game is present in several languages, is the most downloaded language version with over a million downloads. And in the last update, we put something new in it, which is not found in any other graphical game version, which is a mouse shape showing you know, articulation differences to help kids map you know, the sounds of, of vowels and consonants uh, with you know, the, the letters. Um, okay, so, and now, uh, a, or about 40 minutes in. So I, I'm going to shift a little bit uh, from early literacy to exposure to violence. Uh, this part of the talk is a little shorter, so um, I'm, I'm pretty sure there'll be time to do it in the next 20 minutes. But uh, just to provide you some context, in 2015, 2016, and this is still true, but there was a, a, a big peak in school and uh, overall violence in Brazil. Um, and, you know, this is a video from a school playground in our hometown and shots are fired just outside the school and kids run back in. And at that point, Porto Alegre, which is our hometown, uh, actually was among the 20 most dangerous cities in the world. I don't think it is anymore, but uh, it caught the interest of the Inter-American Development Bank. They had, they were doing several behavioral and social studies across Latin America and Brazil with uh, exposure to violence and teenagers. But they approached us and they said, you know, we would like to try, you know, it wasn't gonna be something huge, but to try to do uh, a, a cognitive, you know, uh, 
brain function and brain uh, anatomy study of exposure to violence, what can we do? And this is, you know, a story of, of first interaction with, uh, you know, a funder who never funded brain imaging before ever. Um, and, you know, their expectation of cost was of course much lower uh, because what they're used to doing is, you know, doing these large uh, pencil and paper and, uh, you know, social and behavioral studies. But when we told them, you know, what it costs to scan someone and, you know, transportation and everything else, uh, we were able to get funding to scan about 120 kids and we ended up with 60. And the story here is we started with 250 and the, some of these schools were in you know such violent areas and some of the families were so poor that we they just stopped you know participating we lost track of them a lot of them quit and this is a map of Porto Alegre with the schools in different areas some less and some more violent the darker ones would be the more violent uh, regions but what we found in the end is it didn't really make a difference uh, kids were from most schools were exposed to some level of violence anyway this is the the study protocol. Uh, in this study, we also collected uh, hair cortisol, so we took a hair sample in addition to doing the juvenile victimization questionnaire, which is a, a questionnaire that is adapted for children to report on their experiences. And we tested executive function, did the brain scans and, and all this other stuff. And so in general, uh, you know, this is the distribution of what we found. And one important data here is the peers, uh, about a quarter of kids had experienced violence from peers or siblings but the factor peers here um, uh, is of interest because that's violence in school and that's what the idb was sort of looking wanting to look at is okay what part of that violence come from school and there's you know there's an interesting uh data from central and south america that 80 percent of teenagers and early teenagers think that the school school is not a safe place Right. So that's a kind of, you know, part of the all of the discussion that that come, came behind before this uh, uh, smaller uh, imaging study, but really uh, understanding, you know, what the what this place that's supposed to be a safe harbor for for developing and for learning and for growing is actually perceived by a lot of teenagers as a, a dangerous place. So just uh, also so you have an idea of what we mean by hair cortisol, we would collect a uh, small like a pinch of hair from the back of the hair uh, of girls and boys. Uh, we would try to get three centimeters, but with boys mostly, we usually only got one to two centimeters. So that's two centimeters about, is about one inch, a little less than one inch. Um, it, it wasn't a lot of hair, so it didn't, you know, on the boys, sometimes it would show a little bit of a gap, but in the girls, it was, we would lift their hair like we did here and you know, just take a little bit out uh, under this, you know, with the supervision of the parents. Um, and that cortisol, there's a whole process of, of uh, the hair, there's a whole process of, you know, turning it into, um, diluting it and mincing it and turning it into this blob or, or, or liquid that you can extract the cortisol from. And um, that was, you know, my, I had a, that postdoc that helped develop the, the, the social trier study. He was the one that was involved in this here. Um, so one of the nice things that we found that were uh, of interest to us is that what kids, you know, these were 11 to 13 year olds, what they reported in their, in their JVQ uh, questionnaires correlated uh, nicely with their cortisol levels. And this is, again, there's no norming for cortisol. So basically what we'd see is, you know, more exposure, more cortisol in 30 and 60 day um, uh, measure. So 30 day is the first centimeter, you know, your hair grows about one centimeter per month. So from the scalp, the first, the past 30 days are sort of represented in cortisol of that first centimeter and the past 60 days of the second centimeter, for example. Um, and in the subsequent paper, we were able to collect additional data um, and go a little further and find, you know, be able to separate these kids in, in three groups of highly poly victimized and low poly victimized, which basically means kids who experience two or more uh, uh, acts of violence or, or, or trauma in the past year, or then three or more. And then also showing how it 
it had some high correlations with uh, somatic complaints, anxiety, and other types of um, uh, so uh, of items that we identify with the child behavior checklist. Um, so anyway, that's the kind of you know setting up the the brain imaging stuff. And as I'm sure most of you know, one of the ways that we read people and interact, you know, we're very social beings. So when we look at people, you know, we usually there's you know a little bit of variation, but we'll look for their eyes, their nose and mouth, sort of that uh, movement um, for visual cues in a addition to auditory and body language cues and, you know, to try to understand and, and direct and, and make decisions about our interaction. Am I pleasing this person? Is this person my friend? Is this person going to attack me? Is this person, you know, what is this person doing? Uh, those of you who are familiar with the studies on uh, autism spectrum disorder, you know, not only is there, you know, visual uh, pattern of looking for, for uh, face cues, erratic, but even if they are trained to look for some of these cues, it's, you know, their brains don't really respond like uh, non-ASD brains do to these visual cues and understand them as information to inform behavior. There are, there are studies showing, you know, that maybe, you know, there are some ways to train and stuff, but I don't, don't want to go into that. But basically the point here is one of the tasks that we did with these kids in the fMRI was uh, reading the mind in the eyes task, which is a very simple task in which kids see 32 uh, pairs of eyes, 16 from men, 16 from women. It's just a pair of eyes and the nose. And they have different, you know, visual cues and they have to decide if that person is sad, happy. And then they see the same pairs of eyes and all they have to do, you know, sort of in a, in a, in a uh, you know, the crack and lock card, you know, lower and higher uh, memory tasks or whatever, um, they have to just decide if that's uh, a, a man or a woman. Um, you know, so these kids uh, whom we analyzed and the ones that we, uh, we evaluated and we were able to bring to the Brain Institute, you know, they would do the task uh, in the scanner. It's just, this is, there's no sound here. Uh, it's just, you know, illustration. That's, you know, part of the task they would get a pair of eyes and they had to make a decision about what you know that person how that person was feeling um you know here an example and so the same pairs of eyes are shown twice but the task is different first is is this man happy is this man angry you know there's always two options and the other is is this a man is this a woman and and by the way it doesn't say is this you know is this man happy it just says happy or sad um, so this we published in developmental science, um, and this was, you know, at the time we were really happy with the study and happy that we were able to find, uh, you know, something that stands up to, you know, a, a, even though it's just a cross-sectional study, it doesn't show how, you know, these kids develop or if that develops, uh, if these change differences in activation will result in anything, but the evidence show that the same result that we found, which is a deactivation or a negative correlation in superior temporal sulcus activation associated with exposure to violence or with trauma early in life uh, has been associated with later uh, increased risk for you know, uh, quality of life outcomes, let's say, you know, in different uh, spheres of you know, uh, society and, and what we can see here. So only in the social task did we see this correlation in the superior temporal sulcus and, and in the fusiform gyrus, the right fusiform gyrus um, for these kids. When we analyze the, the data for the same uh, sets of eyes and in which they only have to say if it's a man or a woman, there was no such uh, correlation uh, or effect in, in association with violence. Uh, another result that we found is, you know, which is not as, um, um, I mean, it's it's interesting, but you know, it's it's still it would be something that would have to be further retested. Is we found that when kids were doing the the social task, there was also an increased uh, connectivity between the fusiform gyrus and the amygdala associated with exposure to violence. Now, you know, this is this group is not big enough to you know make assumptions about 
actual changes in lasting changes in brain function. But what it did suggest was, you know, these kids, you know, 11 to 12 year olds were more exposed to violence. The exposure to violence did correlate with how their bodies responded. They had more hair cortisol. And in the social task, there was a difference in how their brains responded to deciding, you know, what the person was feeling. You know, what does that mean in terms of their development and what's affecting? Um, you know, we really would take following up on, but it does suggest that uh, violence could be impairing, you know, their, so their, how their brains function socially. Yeah. Uh, and the other task that I'm going to report for this study is an executive function task. And we all know, you know, something critical for early adolescence and adolescence. And I, uh, this is sort of a, um, uh, a ripoff from, uh, you know, the Harvard group that studies trauma and adolescence, including Charles Nelson. And they, you know, they have this sentence, there's lots of power, but not enough control. And the only thing I added here is, you know, an adolescent, adolescent is kind of like having a Volkswagen Beetle and putting a Ferrari engine in it. There's a lot of power going on. There's a lot of development and, you know, hormones being pumped and emotions and peer uh, acceptance being sought. But the brakes and the steering, you know, are not prepared for that engine. They're still, the, you know, being worked on and developed, and you know, not ready to, to you know, put the brakes on and control. And this picture from Matt Calf's 1999 paper. There, there are other, you know, more recent ones. I think it's, it's, you know, it's really nice because it shows how what you know what interactions and how the prefrontal cortex including the uh anterior cingulate cortex which is important for our discussion here is critical for that our ability to control ourselves and what are the threats to self-regulation at different uh from different you know be they genetic or environmental uh sources so you know of course these in brazil why are we looking at this let me skip forward to a slide here and then I'll come back. And why was the also you know, the brain, the uh, Inter-American Development Bank interested in this is Latin America and Brazil have a really high number of ninis. You know, the, uh, in English, it's the youth uh, not, uh, not employed and not in education. Um, so in yellow there, uh, you see Brazil in this, you know, this is pre-pandemic again. Uh, Brazil is 23. Uh, El Salvador and Central, you know, some of these Central American countries are around the same uh, number. Mexico is 25. So the, the issue here is, you know, understanding all of the factors that contribute to kids in Latin America and Central America feeling so, feeling such despair, you know, that they quit school. And of course, violence isn't the only one. And the risks and bad decisions they make isn't the only reason, but it's certainly as we understand how the brain develops, the fact that exposure to violence and trauma can, you know, make that risk taking sort of period between adolescence and adulthood uh, last longer or last, you know, never sort of develop or not even in the sense of how, you know, brain development, but putting these kids, you know, in the path of making bad decisions in very dangerous situations. So this is what the IDB was concerned with. And the other question that we tried to answer, you know, it doesn't answer the whole thing, but, you know, what is the effect of violence on cognitive function? And, you know, what with our behavioral pilots, we first saw, okay, executive function tasks. We did a composite score uh, of, uh, um, oh, I think it was, I think this is end back task. And, can't remember all the other ones, but there was a correlation between exposure to violence and a you know, decrease in performance in executive function outside the scanner. So we, we asked, okay, so can we find that inside the scanner? And part of the neural basis for executive function has a very critical hub in the anterior cingulate cortex and in these posterior superior and inferior parietal areas. And so what we did is, uh, you know, these are the same kids that did the reading the mind in the eyes task. They did, uh, I'm sorry for the Portuguese here, but you know, this is a, a slide I just took from you know, other presentations. There, you might notice that sometimes there's a little bit of Portuguese, but it's inhibitory control. And it's a very simple go, no go task. So over nine minutes, 
with their left hand, they either press uh, with their middle finger or their uh, index finger for X and O, and then randomly they get a blue square. And that's when they have to use the unpreferred sort of uh, response, motor response with the right hand. Um, and then of course here we use the right hand because these are all right-handed participants and we don't want the, any latency having to do with, uh, you know, the fact that they are right-handed and then you'd be pressing with your left hand, of course. So I usually like to show you guys what they would see in the scanner. So this is what they'd be see, they would see you know, for about nine minutes. And every time they see one of these, they have to press you know, with their index or their middle finger. Oops, there comes the blue. And then you know, this is what they're doing over that period of time. I'm not timing this right, you know, just as an example. So for about nine and a half minutes, that's what these kids do. And it's natural that over nine minutes, your latency in response with the right hand to the random, you know, unpreferred blue square may increase. What that means is, is if that first, you know, you respond in 300, 400 milliseconds to the blue square with time, there's a chance that increases uh, gradually as you, you know, lose focus and uh, your ability to sustain attention. Uh, drops off. And this is natural, but the question was, okay, is there a correlation or any association of exposure to violence with uh, differences in brain function in areas that are relevant to executive function? And I, I forgot to put the reference here. So this was published in uh, Social Cognitive and Affective Neuroscience. And the first author is Kara, C-A-R-A, which is a former student of mine who's actually a, a, a psychiatry resident in at the University of Miami right now. So we, we did find that recent violence over the past year and chronic violence, which with these kids, it really means violence over the past two or three years because they, you know, when they're, I mean, when they're 12 and 11 and what they're reporting on uh, can, you know, can date back a few years, but usually uh, most of the violence was recent, but even though, even when we separated, broke the score down into more, the more chronic violence, you know, everything that was before uh, was past one year and everything that was just recent, there was a negative correlation with frontal parietal activation and the anterior cingulate, you know, cortex in this region, you know, more superior uh, dorsal region, which is associated with executive function, um, showed a negative association with violence. And so it's important to remember that this is the part of the anterior cingulate cortex that has, is associated with executive function because the ventral anterior cingulate would be, you know, limbic and more related to um, emotions, uh, let's say. And this, that's not what we found. This was in the anterior cingulate. So, okay, so what does that mean? So when we uh, correlate that activation with, we, we extracted, you know, the betas for anterior singlet uh, activation from participants and correlated that with a, a measure of the latency or how much their, their response time dropped off over nine minutes. What we found was the more the response dropped off, the more also there was a decrease in that activation uh, of the anterior singlet cortex, for example. So, Basically, trying to show, okay, you know, what, what does it mean more exposed to violence, less anterior cingulate activation? Are they mind wandering? What's going on? Well, in this case, it meant that um, there is also a, an association with uh, the fact that these kids who were more exposed to violence had a harder time sustaining attention, and their brains also showed that in how they dropped off uh, in terms of activation. Um, so, and this was a really interesting development. Uh, after the first year of, of working with the IDB and all the work that we put in, they really wanted to try a different site. So Alex Franco, here he is again, my friend, uh, down here with me, and I, we went to Tegucigalpa, uh, Honduras, three times over, you know, the span of about three years, and we helped researchers there, Dr. Virna Lopez, she's right here and um, uh, some of their students and, and colleagues set up a, you know, a study of adolescents in Tegucigalpa. These were a little bit older uh, and they didn't have the fMRI set up there, but we were able to do um, resting state. And you know, this is a picture of Tegucigalpa. It's Tegucigalpa is 
if not number one, it's been among the top three most violent cities uh, in the world for a long time. And it really is violent. Even coming from Brazil, I, you know, we stayed in a part of town that was extremely militarized. You know, this was a normal scene, seeing, you know, guards and uh, with rifles and, and, and um, shields. And you walk into the hotel and restaurants, there's someone with a rifle and a machine gun. So it's, you know, it's constantly there. And visiting the schools there, we had to sort of drive out to these uh, more marginal areas of the city that were, of course, more violent. And uh, one not so nice experience we had there is we were actually tear gassed in a, at the university uh, during that time. And I tell you, it's I never want to have to go through that again. But we did take the study there. You know, it was really hard to collect the data. Uh, but we some of the preliminary stuff that we have is these are different age groups, different scanners. So we're not, I mean, they both did the, the juvenile victimization questionnaire. So we're not going to compare the groups, but we are, what we are finding in, in these kids in both in the resting state in both countries, uh, and uh, the, the reference is cut out here. This is a, from a, a meta-analysis of uh, resting state and exposure to violence and trauma in, in early childhood and adolescence. Um, there, you know, we're finding some association between the uh, anterior singlet uh, cortex uh, resting state, you know, behavior in both Brazil and Honduras, and uh, the connectivity to some of these posterior regions, including uh, uh, the superior occipital, the, uh, the um, uh, posterior cingulate, and the precuneus. This is, you know, still in the works, but um, and it was really challenging because the, the data in Honduras, the quality of the data was really challenging to work with. The, so just so you have an idea, we didn't do any anatomical analysis because when we put their T1s in FSL and we collected T1s and T2s and tried to use both to help, FSL didn't even recognize that data. It said, this is not structural data. And, but it was, it was good enough to do, you know, AFNI and, and the resting state. But um, anyway, so that's still unpublished, but we, uh, I guess, more so of the experience and hopefully this result, this study will come out. Um, you know, we're being very careful with the data and the analysis because of all the noise in there. But I think we have some, some reliable anterior posterior uh, connectivity association with exposure to violence in these um, in these kids. So we're at 65 minutes. Uh, I put this here to stop myself so I can go really fast through Graffle Game Brazil, just so you guys have an idea. Uh, last year, we tried to do, you know, a, a study and we have a new one ongoing now. We weren't able to implement, you know, the Graffle Game protocol due to frequent cancellation and student absence during COVID. But uh, some of the data that we did find in first and second grade was really uh, worrisome because these kids were not at a, the expected level of uh, syllable level, uh, uh, you know, phonological awareness. Well, Gaspar, is, can I stop you, know, you for just for a second? Yeah. Sorry. How much time yeah. do you think? I, I know some people. Oh, this is like there's two slides. It. There's two slides on it. And then yeah. is it done or were you it's going just, to ask right, this is it. Yeah. The, okay. So, you know. We pre-tested and we weren't able to post-test or do, but you know, there's you know, some really worrisome study uh, data there. And this is just a, a screenshot from our other work with the IDB, in which we're developing this uh, automated fluency, reading fluency uh, um, app for uh, Portuguese and Spanish, and hopefully French and English in the future. And just pictures of the lab in different times, you know, 2014 and so, and there's way too many people to thank, so it's not, I try to put a picture there with most people, um, but it wouldn't be fair to, I think I'd probably forget someone if I try to name it. <laughs> it's them. always tricky. So that was, yeah, that was it. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you. That was really everything from early literacy imaging to um, cortisol stuff and, and high stress and the environment that you scanned and set it up and have done all that is pretty remarkable. And then going into kind of graphic game. I'd love to ask some questions about cortisol, but I'm sure other people do also. And I um, I need to get going. Um, and so I'm gonna hand over host access to Caroline and she will host it for me and close up. But um, 
Does anyone have questions? And then I'll sort of have to disappear. I apologize. By the way, um, I can send the PDF of the presentation if that helps, and if you guys make that available later on. Great, great. Thank you. That sounds great. Does anyone have questions? Okay, I'm going to be selfish and start with a question. So I apologize if I missed okay. this. Oh, is someone, is it okay, Caroline, if I ask a question? Yes, please. <laughs> oh, great, great. Um, so cortisol, hair cortisol, and we've done kind of some things in younger kids looking at kind of, um, it seems like a very easy, I mean, nothing is easy or often comes with a cost, but right. you do the, you cut the hair and you look at the past one to three months of stress level. And there's a couple of different measures that you can obtain from it. Did you look at just cortisol, hair cortisol? Did you look at other measures as well? That's kind of question number one. And the reason why I'm asking is this is you looked at, you had, I think there was a J something measure that was some behavioral measures. And was that a positive correlation with increased cortisol? Oh, is that violence measure? Questionnaire. Oh yeah, it's the it's the JVQ, the juvenile victimization question. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah. So that went in the right direction. I was just curious. We were trying to look at sort of executive function correlations, mm -hmm. and it was kind of showing an interesting, unexpected kind of correlation. So I'm wondering how robust your results in is in, and if you looked at kind of relationship or mediation sort of models with um, um, executive function mm -hmm. or other kinds of measures or other things, how you might expect it to look like. Right. So um, first about cortisol, we didn't um, investigate other, you know, measures of, uh, of hormone or anything else. But um, it, the, the nice thing about hair cortisol is it gives you a chronic measure. Right? So that's basically why we did it, because we wanted to sort of have an something more chronic, uh, because in saliva, as you well know, there's variation, you know, during the day and uh, you sort of like in the trial, you kind of have to bring, you know, so, you know, we didn't do anything else is this was already challenging as it was. Um, and the correlation did go in the right direction with the JVQ it's and the JVQ, what it does is it asks kids, you know, what they experienced, uh, the different types of experiences. And when they say yes, it goes deeper into it. Um, and it's something they answer in uh, by themselves. And this was one of the biggest challenges and leading to the answer to this, your second question is, so we wanted to have a larger behavioral study. And we at first got about 250 uh, informed consents from different schools. We were able to do the behavioral part with executive function and the JVQ with half that. Not because of, you know, it, because uh, families asked to drop, drop off. A lot of them at some point became scared. They didn't want, you know, people in the community knowing that their kids were part of a violence study because that raised some you know, concerns with people who, you know, are operating outside, let's say the, the legal scope of things. And um, we had to, you know, we had to, as you know, when there were children who reported abuse or neglect, we had to report that to authorities. But luckily, I mean, at least when that happened with us, it was always situations in which the parents, it was, you know, something that had been reported already, there was nothing new. So it, our behavioral study had about 110 kids and we had to make a sort of a composite score to find a correlation between ex exposure to violence and um, uh, executive function. And exactly what that score is, I can't remember, but I know that we we're, we're just, we submitted the paper, so it should uh, come out. Uh, so I, I just can't remember everything, but I think it's like a composite between NBAC um, and um, working memory and some some uh, 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 inhibitory control or something like that. Great. So to answer your question, it, was, it wasn't, you know, it's to really trust that in, you know, in terms of a, you know, population level or, you know, is this, is this really being, you'd have to you'd have to do a behavior study with a lot more kids than we did. Right, great, thank you. I'm gonna to have to jump off, but I'll let Caroline run sure. the show and ask um, some more questions for people who can stay on longer. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Thank you. Happy